Well, the discovery was made in 1979. At the time, uh, we were trying to understand how tumor viruses cause cancer in animals with the hope that such an understanding might lead to a, a better understanding of human cancer disease. But if you, if you go back to, to the end of the 70s, beginning of the, of the 80s, how was it received by the scientific community? Surprisingly, there was no um, doubt, I think. It happened very quickly that people accepted this, this new idea, uh, which is somewhat surprising. Often when something new is discovered, people are skeptical, and they say, well, that can't be right, because it's new, and this time, but you weren't skeptical. I, I was not skeptical. I knew it was right. And several other people working in the same field replicated it with their own systems. And I think enough people, you know, showing the same thing really quickly uh, influences the rest of the field. So. The discovery of, uh, of tyrosine phosphorylation, there was a lot of serendipity in the discovery. I was doing what I thought was a routine experiment with a predictable outcome, and instead I discovered something new, largely because I had been too lazy to make up a fresh uh, buffer solution, and as a result of using an old buffer solution for my experiment, it turned out that something, a new chemical appeared that wouldn't have happened if I'd used a fresh buffer solution. And so it's hard to explain that to people that, you know, there is an element of chance or luck in making discoveries. That, uh, and, but you have to recognize uh, that it is something important. As uh, Pasteur said, you know, chance favors the prepared mind. And so I think that's, that's an important thing for the public to know is that, you know, not everything not every discovery is, is a planned process. You have to be a bit lucky. You have to be a bit lucky often, yes. When and how did you realize uh, that your findings were of such a great importance? Yeah, it did take a few years, I think. As I said, you know, our original work was with viruses. We, we couldn't be quite certain that what we'd found with the viral uh, transformation systems were going to be relevant to the human disease, but I think, you know, two to three years in, it was pretty obvious this was going to be important. From chicken to mer viruses to, to uh, effective therapies for, for, for humans, it's, it's for human cancer, it's, it's a big step. It is a big step, and it did require, you know, some, some leap of faith in some sense. I mean, it, the pharmaceutical industry didn't immediately jump on this, partly because we thought, or they thought, that all protein kinases, so all of the enzymes that add phosphate to other proteins, use the universal ATP molecule, the energy molecule of cells. And so they thought that um, it would be very difficult to find chemicals that were selective enough for a single protein kinase as opposed to the whole family. And so there, I think there was some hesitance about going, hesitation about going into that field. And so it really took academic scientists to show you could make selective inhibitors of individual protein kinases, and then finally the pharmaceutical industry, particularly Siba Geigy in Basel, uh, started a program. Interestingly, their initial program actually wasn't for cancer, it was for restenosis. That's the, after a balloon angioplasty for coronary artery disease, the arteries often close up again, and they were trying to block that with a a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And it was that drug, actually, that later became Gleevec, the drug that treats the leukemia. So even they weren't going directly after cancer. What would you say was, was the key, the, the, the most important thing that, that you discovered? I think the most amazing thing is that this process of adding phosphate to tyrosine, tyrosine phosphorylation, is used so universally. 
uh, in cells to govern all sorts of processes from proliferation, from cell uh, growth, to migration, to differentiation, even to the cell cycle of when one cell becomes two. All of these processes use tyrosine phosphorylation in one way or another. And interestingly, this process was invented, if you like, or selected for during evolution in animal cells. So bacteria don't use tyrosine phosphorylation uh, in the same way. So if this is something that happened after cells acquired a nucleus. And not all, not all single cell uh, nu nucleated pro uh, cells use tyrosine phosphorylation either. So, so it was a fairly late development uh, in evolution. And I think it, it's used because it's a very good way of one cell to signal to another, which is what you need in a multicellular organism. This was, was basic research to start with. Did you ever think about the clinical applications? We didn't really think about clinical applications. I mean, that we were basic researchers. We sort of understood it could be a target, but in those days, we didn't try and patent the idea that you could make an inhibitor of a tyrosine kinase, and that would become a drug. It was a different time then. Now, you know, you discover something new, you immediately think about whether it might be translated into a, a clinical application. But back in 1979, it was a different mindset then. But, but, but what could you say about the importance of basic research to reach to applications, so to speak? I mean, there's a, there's a gap, more or less. Right, no, I'm, I'm convinced it's just as essential now as, as it was then. We still don't understand many things about cells or how normal cells differ from cancer cells despite all the advances in genomics and, and other sorts of technology. There are still many unknowns. And as I said, I think it's continues to be vital to support basic research um, so that new, new targets, new processes can be identified that then may be you know, targeted in, in drug development. What's your driving force? I think my driving force is I'm still excited by a new result. And I can, even though I don't do lab work myself anymore, I haven't done for several years, when someone in my group comes to me with a new result or shows me a new result, I can be excited about it and think, you know, what does it mean? What's the next experiment? I just love discovering new things, even, you know, after 50 years after I started as a researcher, I'm still excited by a beautiful new result. I'm still curious. I'm still curious about how, the cells, how cells work, right? When you wish to, to relax from science, what do you do? I love the outdoors, and we do a lot of outdoors activity, river rafting, hiking, skiing, camping. So we try and get out and get away from you know, the, the pressures of the lab. If you should give an advice to, to a student, uh, what would your advice be? I tell you know, graduate students when they interview um, that you need to be passionate about what you do. There's no point going into basic research and thinking it's a day in nine to five job. You have to be passionate about it. There is still plenty to discover, so you, you, know, you don't need to worry that um, everything is already known. I think that's clearly not the case. But I do think you know, they have to be passionate about it, and they need to ask important questions. They, don't, they shouldn't just try and do the next obvious thing. They need to define a question that they can really get their teeth into and spend you know, months, years working on it, I think. And it's hard work. I, I don't tell it's not something you're going to you know, work just nine to five. You're going to have to work long hours. Um, and a lot of people, I think, are turned off by the thought that, you know, they're going to have to work hard and that, as in any research effort, not everything is going to work for you. There are going to be lots of failures before you have success. But having, being successful, on the other hand, is a fantastic feeling, I guess. It is an amazing feeling to be the first person to know something, right? That's, that's really an amazing feeling. <laughs>